I get a notification. So I'm going to just give it a few moments. I'm going to talk some gibberish, or as Scotland as we say, haver, uh, until we eventually get some uh, some people in. Although I know that there are a bunch of people waiting uh, to get in, which is great, and get some viewers. Uh, we are beaming this out now across uh, Facebook, YouTube, Periscope. Uh, directly, I said Facebook, Facebook, YouTube, Periscope, oh, and Twitch. And then as of tomorrow, I will also be running it out of Mixer, which is great. So if you're in and you're in any of the uh, the, 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 um, the viewing systems that have a chat ability, drop me a uh, hey and let me know that you're here. I can see that there's a, a number of people in already from across the platforms. It's also worth saying, and I will remind people of this as I go through the, um, the stream, that we have different people commenting on different platforms, but I can see them all at once. And so if I start answering a question that you haven't seen in your platform because I'm helping another teacher or parent or student with a particular question, you might not have seen the question. And so what I'll try and do is I'll try and reflect the question um, before I answer it. Because this morning I had lots and lots of input, but some people didn't know why I was answering certain questions. So we'll just give it a few minutes to start. Um, and then we can um, we can go from there. Let me go back to the game though, because we really ought to be on that page. So when people start the stream, that's what they see. That's better, don't you think? I think so. Do you like my lights? My studio looks all right, eh? My little camera. So we, uh, I decided, it was actually only this weekend I decided I was going to put this together because I have been inundated with, because uh, of this whole remote learning, distance learning thing, I've been inundated with people saying, please, please, please help me to make sense of this Minecraft stuff. Hi from South Africa, from Sud Africa. Um, please help me to... Um, Please help me to make sense of this Minecraft thing. I've just been, my kids have been given a license as part of their Microsoft EDU. Um, the, I'm going to explain later that Microsoft have given it free to everyone uh, who has an Office 365 EDU license. And lots and lots and lots of people have been saying, my kids have this. Um, oh, hi, Amanda. Um, uh, thanks for joining. And lots and lots of people have said, help me out here. So that's what I decided to do. I just thought rather than, because I've had... LinkedIn messages, I've had Twitter messages, I've had, uh, I, you wouldn't believe it, like people reach out to you in the strangest of ways. I think the only thing I haven't had is a Hogwarts owl for help and my window's open just in case that happens. But, um, but yeah, it's crazy, crazy how many ways in which people can reach it. So I, um, I decided to do this. I decided to put all of this together and just, and it was quick, it was super quick. And I have to say, if anybody out there um, so far watching so far wants to try this, it's actually remarkably easy to set up um, using, I mean, you could just do it with OBS, um, Open Broadcasting Software, it's a program, OBS, if you just Google that. Um, or alternatively, you could do it with just Twitch or Mixer and their own inbuilt um, streaming systems particularly Twitch, I noticed, has its own one, which is actually quite easy to set up. Uh, Twitch Studio, it's called. But I actually found something yesterday called Stream uh, Restream.io. And what Restream Restream.io and what Restream.io does is lets you... I put this out on one platform, i.e. I'm using OBS, and it goes out to Twitch, it goes out to YouTube, it goes out to Facebook, and so on. And so I can capture so many people... Um, rather than assuming everyone's going to want to come along the one stream. So um, so I'm going to get started. And the reason uh, I decided to do this was because of all the help that I'm being asked for across the world. Um, I've had requests from as far away as Vietnam and New Zealand and, and so on. And it's kind of hard for me to do all of this in the right times so that everybody can join in. But these will also be recorded. They're all recorded and they all stay there. Um, on YouTube or on Facebook or whatever, so people can revisit them as often as they as often as they wish. And what I want to do is basically over the next month, I'm going to go. I'm going to do two a day every day for a month. And while today's have been the same, 
uh, afternoon and evening, every day we'll have two separate ones, two different ones. And we're going to do everything. We're going to do everything from why Minecraft? What is Minecraft? Uh, today I'm going to take you through the settings of Minecraft. Um, it's not going to be the most exciting stream for the first one, but it's purely so that we get everyone to the same space. Everyone understands what it is, how to switch it on, how to deal with the settings, why it's important. And then we're going to do redstone, we're going to have an archaeological dig, we're going to get some visitors in, we're going to do, we're going to make skins, we're going to create resource packs, uh, we're going to look at pre-built worlds and, and, and take you through the library. We're going to do some chemistry. You name it. We're even going to do some esports titles. Um, we're going to do so much stuff over the next month. So uh, so let's see where we can where we can get to. And I don't care if you're a teacher or a, a, an educator of another kind or you're a parent or you're even a student. Everyone is welcome. Please ask questions. Uh, this is all about building a community at this particularly difficult time and helping everyone to have a little piece of something that they can do. But hey, look at this. We've got Norway in, we've got Tassie in from Norway. We've got uh, South Africa. We've got a, a couple in from South Africa. We've also got Selvin uh, from El Salvador. Hi, Selvin. I know you're uh, a hugely active member of the community. And so greetings from all over the world. This is fantastic. I love this. And this is why I did, uh, and this is why I did two. Uh, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, so that we could try and capture as many people from the, around the world um, as possible. So let's make a start. Um, people can join obviously as, as and when they want to, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through uh, Minecraft Education Edition and it's really important that we start with first of all what it is and why I choose to use it. I've been using Minecraft for 12, well this will be 11, we'll be in our 11th year but heading on for 12 years of actively using Minecraft to teach. Um, it, it, it's now in its 11th year of um, and I'm talking about when it was free on the internet and it was kind of released by mistake and it was a very, very basic building block, but there was no redstone, there was no ores, there was nothing you could really do other than build stuff. Um, and I started using it for education way back then. And we've come on, come on leaps and bounds and the game does so much now and there's a massive community around it and it's super exciting. And so... Um, Originally, there was only the Java version, uh, which some of you are still probably most au fait with um, and, and have maybe your, your kids at home are playing it now while they're kind of stuck in the house or whatever. But also Microsoft, about five years ago, Microsoft purchased uh, licensing for um, Minecraft and moved it to what they call the Bedrock uh, edition, which was um, slightly different, ultimately the same concept, slightly different. And what it does is it um, it's available on iOS, it's available on Xbox, Nintendo Switch, PlayStation. Uh, it's basically put it across as many platforms as they, as they could, and that's fantastic. And then from Bedrock came the Education Edition, which was originally a program called Minecraft EDU, which was, uh, which was developed by Teacher Gaming. Um, uh, a Finnish startup um, who, who uh, led by uh, Santeri Koivisto and Joe Levin, who, who, who developed that. And that was taken on and it was, it was developed and it was fantastic. And we loved it as a community. We loved the education edition that was then. And Microsoft stayed true to that and said, well, we'll develop another one. Um, so they did. And it's education edition. Now, why do I use it? I'm going to show you some of over the next sort of month. Remember, we're doing two streams a day every day for a month. But one of the reasons I use it uh, in the way that I do is so that we can um, so that we can use the education features that are inside the game and those features I'm going to be talking to you about over the next month. We're going to be showing you NPCs, we're going to be showing you Code Builder, uh, we're going to be showing you Advanced Book and Quills, uh, Build Aloud and iBlocks, the camera function, you name it, we're going to be showing you it. And, and all of the classroom mode, all of these things are extremely important. Um, but ultimately, if you're sitting at home thinking, but I don't have that version, first of all, you may already have it, and I'll talk to you about that shortly. Secondly, everything I'm about to show you, apart from things like the NPC and maybe the camera function, can still be done in regular Minecraft. So it doesn't matter. I'm going to try and teach you over the next month the core of all of the things you can be doing with Minecraft, regardless of the version that you have. So um, stick with me. So first things first, I want to go through the settings, and I keep apologising for this simply because this will not be the most ex um, exciting stream. But... Um, Oh, we've got 60 people in from across multiple platforms. How exciting. 
this is good. Um, hi to whoever those 60 people are. This is great. And hello, Natalie. Great to see you. And so I want to start with settings. Before we dive into play, which we're going to be doing tomorrow, I want to dive into settings. This is really important because I would say something like between 60 and 70% of the help that we get asked for either as a company or as a Minecraft mentor uh, or, or you know, however people reach out to me, it's generally a setting problem. It's generally that they haven't got a global resource set up that they should have or the controls aren't working properly or the video uh, settings are not right and the game is, is, is showing them something that they don't see on a video for example, um, or on a YouTube video, for example, um, or world settings specifically, like it's not immutable or the kids are able to hurt each other and, and I didn't think they could or the weather is, is constantly raining and I don't know why. And it's little things like that. And these are the foundations of, of why Minecraft Education Edition is so effective is because there's so much you can do in the settings that, that mean that, that you never have to worry about that again. So let's get that done first. We're going to get that out of the way so tomorrow we can start playing and we can start being creative and we can start exploring education uh, proper. But if we go into settings, the first thing we have on the left hand side are a series of menus. So you see keyboard, controller, touch, profile, video, etc. And that changes what's going on on the right hand side of the screen. So I'm going to head back up to uh, Accessibility. So we start with accessibility. We have a UI screen reader. I'll be honest, I've never used that. I don't know what it is. Maybe we should explore it as one of our streams. Not this one, but let's explore it as one of our streams uh, later on. What I do and have used, and it's not hugely effective, but it certainly does help those who need it, is enable text to speech for chat. So if the kids are chatting and anything you put in the chat function is then kind of turned into uh, text to speech and it comes out in a kind of a semi robotic voice um, and you can pop that on. So just keep an eye on that. What's also worth mentioning and we're going to do a whole stream later about the immersive reader um, which is built in which doesn't show up in accessibility um, because it's actually built into the game. But keep it, keep that in mind because we're going to do that later. Then we're going to move down to this is the the, the, the heading is controls. And what's great about the Bedrock Edition and significantly for the Classroom, the Education Edition, is that you don't just have keyboard and mouse controls. You have controller and touchscreen controls. And you'll see that if we go to controller, you can change any of these controls and you can make those controls set up the way you want, the keyboard and mouse, the touchscreen and so on. The reason this is great is because we're working with generations of children that don't do keyboard and mouse. The number of times I'm in a camp or I'm at a school or a classroom and... Uh, I'm not sure if you can send me pics, Tassie. I'm not sure. Try it. I have no idea. Um, I mean, I would let you. I just don't know if you're capable of doing it. Um, although you're coming through Facebook, so you are. Um, and so the keyboard and mouse function is not always the preferred version. And I have kids come in to me and I'm always amazed. They come in to me and they say, I love Minecraft. Never, ever played it with a mouse or keyboard, which, of course, I come from a mouse and keyboard generation, so it's really just bias for me. And I say to them, what do you do? And they say, oh, I play it on a touch screen. And I say, well, that's great. We have touch screen devices. We can set that up. Now, you might not, and that's a different different um, consideration. Um, but if you're using bring your own device, for example, that's fine too. Um, or they say, I use a controller. It's probably most common, actually, with a controller. I use an Xbox controller because I play it on the Xbox or whatever. And I say, good, well, bring your controller in. It's probably USB. We'll plug it in and you can set the controls up to be what you want. Something else that's really, really nice is the Xbox Adaptive Controller. If you haven't already seen this, check it out online. Go on Google Xbox Adaptive Controller, Microsoft Adaptive Controller. And it's basically this incredible uh, multifaceted uh, controller, game controller, which has all the same functions. You can press the A button, you can drop uh, an item using this button here, you've got left and right, but it's done in these very big, simple, spread out individual buttons. It's not a handheld controller. And this is for anyone who wants to be able to access these games, but doesn't have the same motor functions or even the same uh, physical abilities of other people. So you can use your elbows, you can use your chin, you can use your... Um, you could, if you've only got one hand, you, you can do it all one-handed. It's incredible um, and it's a phenomenal thing. And you can set the adaptive controller up to work in Minecraft Education Edition, which is fantastic um, for those, uh, those kids in particular who want to join in, but a regular controller, a keyboard or mouse, and even a touch device is not going to work for them. 
And so having done those, uh, looked at those three things, you don't really need to worry too much about this. I'm talking to the parents and the teachers significantly um, because quite often they'll say, uh, a teacher will call me up and say, it's jumping when I'm supposed to be swimming or I can't fly and I don't know why. And what we tend to find is that if you go down to the bottom and click default settings, somebody's changed something, especially in a classroom environment. Sometimes kids will go onto a computer that another child has been using and they'll say, this isn't working the way it should. Left is right and right is left. It's a little trick they like to play. And I just say, look, don't worry about it. Go into keyboard and mouse, controller or touch, and you will always find a default settings button. That's all you really need to worry about, default settings. Underneath that, there's then general settings, and we'll go to profile, and this is just which profile you're under. You'll see that I'm, that's my email address up at the top there. I don't mind, nobody can email me on that anyway. And then if you want to enable single sign-on, I don't do that because I use multiple sign-ons um, for Minecraft anyway. Uh, if you're online, do you want to use cellular data? Generally switch that off. And I've no idea. Require encrypted web sockets is switched on. Who knows? Um, there's things in there that I don't know. Uh, exactly. And then some information on the game itself, which is important and you may uh, need that at a later date. The most important one, however, are video and audio. And we're going to talk about those now. These are the ones that I generally have to troubleshoot. And so we'll start at the top. We clicked on video and we'll start at the top. Um, uh, where do you download Xbox Edu Minecraft version? Uh, actually, you can't that sorry i probably didn't make that clear bedrock is available on xbox and playstation and but education edition isn't education edition is pc mac and ipad uh, ipad sorry so i should have made that clear when i'm talking about xbox i'm talking about bedrock which is the same engine it just isn't education edition so my apologies um so at the top uh we are We've got brightness. Brightness is, I mean, you, you decide um, you can make that larger or smaller. I tend to just leave it at 50 because it suits me and, and, and that kind of, um, there we go. Adam's going to help you with that, Tassie, on Facebook. Um, edu can be enabled in Xbox, just not edu edition. Um, I know that there's a toggle and you can get some of the stuff that works in there. Oh yeah, the, the chemistry mode can be, can be loaded in and so on. Thanks, Adam. Then we're going to go to camera perspective. Now, <clears throat> you'll see all of this. I'm going to go through the settings and not necessarily show you everything because that would mean going in and out of the worlds and we don't have a huge amount of time. But, so I'm going to take them through and I'm going to let you take notes. And then as we go through the month, I'll pick up on these things. So I'm going to change perspective at some point while I'm in the game. And I'm going to say to you, do you remember we did this in the settings? Here we see it again. And so first person, third person or third person front. Let me explain briefly what those are. We always stay in first person. That's inside as you are as a, a kind of a person here looking out of the eyes of your character, looking around as if you were actually in the world. Third person back is you step out of yourself and you're at the back of yourself and you can move and follow yourself around as if you were in front. Um, your, your, your avatar was in front of yourself and you could see it kind of moving around and um, put it into perspective of the world. And then third person front is just bonkers. I've no idea why. Well, the, the only way I ever, the only reason I ever use this is to get good screenshots. But basically this is outside of the, the avatar and facing the avatar so you can see each other. And, the, and as a result, the controls are all back to front and it's really quite confusing. But it's, it's good to actually get... Um, it's good to actually get a, a screenshot with you against a backdrop of something amazing you've made. Uh, we're always going to stick to first person. If you're in game and you find that you are suddenly confronted with either of the other two, you just press the F3 key. Um, I believe that is the same on a PC and a Mac, and I can only speak for PC and a Mac at this point, but you press the F3 key, which will, uh, which will change that. Or F5. Adam, help me out. <laughs> I think it's F5 now. Um, we'll test it. I'll test it while I'm in game. Full screen. This is this is really good for the classroom or, 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 or if you're using it in an educational setting because full screen uh, basically toggles whether the game can be minimised, windowed or closed from the top tab. I actually have mine at the moment uh, not full screen. It looks in the it looks in the in the stream as if it's full screen, but it's actually not. Um, 
And the reason for that is because if it can be minimized or windowed, kids can then come in and out of Minecraft easily, particularly if you want them to do research. So most often when I'm using Minecraft, I have children going in and out of uh, the internet or or different resources, maybe a OneNote document or something, and uh, or, a, or a, you know referring to a PDF, something like that. And what they're doing is they're working outside of Minecraft, dipping back into Minecraft, working in Minecraft, dipping back out to find something out, so on. So I generally don't have it full screen. Uh, hide hand is whether or not you hide the hand in the bottom right hand corner of the uh, the screen. It can take up quite a lot of the screen. Um, I generally don't have that switched on. I don't know why it was switched on there, but anyway, don't hide your hand because then that way you can see what you're carrying. And I'll, again, I'll explain this when we're in the world. Um, where are we? So then the other one is hide paper doll. I do hide my paper doll. Um, and that's just a little model of yourself, which appears in the top right hand, uh, sorry, top left hand side of the screen. And it kind of lets you know where you are and what it is that you're doing. Um, while you're playing. Are you standing? Are you crouching? It's almost like a little mirror of yourself. So you're like, oh, I know what I'm doing. I'm swimming or I'm crouching. Um, you should generally know that when you're playing. But for beginners, I find that if we put it on teachers, when I've been doing CPD with teachers, they're like, oh, I can tell if I'm flying. I can tell if I'm swimming. And they kind of like it as a guide, certainly initially. Um, hide HUD. I don't hide my HUD. That can be done with the F1 key. Um, and the F1 key in game just basically takes away your your HUD um, is your heads up display, which is like your it's an overlay, if you like, that shows your inventory, your little hearts for survival mode, uh, the hand at the side, like I talked about earlier, that kind of stuff. You can take that away by pressing F1 or selecting hide HUD. It's really good for taking good, crisp, clean screenshots without any of the, the jumble of the HUD. Um, but apart from that, I just don't. I have the HUD open because I need to see what I'm carrying, etc. Screen animations. Answers on a postcard. Adam, what does it do? Um, I have no idea. The HUD opacity. Um, and, if, and here's the thing. If I have no idea what it does, it's probably not necessary to play with it. That's the way I kind of... I've never had to use it in any classroom, in any situation ever. So don't worry about it. HUD opacity is just whether or not you want the HUD to be uh, somewhat opaque, somewhat see-through, you know, it's up to you. Um, change screen safe area is just adjusting to you. You'll find that you can make the screen slightly larger or slightly smaller. Um, you probably don't have to worry about this. It, I've only ever had to play with it once and that was to do with video recording. Field of vision, however, is really important. You'll see that our field of vision at the moment is at 60 degrees. Uh, if we make this larger, uh, your field of vision is basically what you can see in front of you. So as I sit here as a healthy human being and I stare straight at you into the camera, I am very aware that there's a whiteboard. I can just see the edge of a whiteboard to my left. And on this side of the room, I can just see the side of a cupboard that's on the other side of the room. And so that's my field of vision, probably about 70 degrees, I imagine. So one, two, one, two, yeah, maybe, yeah, maybe a bit more. Um, Children tend to like this to be wider. If you narrow this, if you go less than 60, you tend to bring it into almost tunnel vision and it brings it in and it sh eventually shrinks the screen until you just have this little doorway that you can look through and it's not really helpful. Children tend to like to make it larger so that they have almost fish eye. I find that lots of adults that then play the game and it tends to be adults um, feel sick if the field of vision is above 60 to 70%. So try to keep it around about there. Show auto save icon. Uh, one thing I will say at this point is I generally don't have that on. It's just a little flash at the top that says auto saving, auto saving, auto saving, and it kind of reminds you that it's auto saving. I tend not to do that. Um, it doesn't. It's not necessary for me. But what I will say is auto save doesn't always work. Generally, it will, but it's good practice to save and quit your world regularly. I've been caught out in major projects where the computer's crashed or Minecraft itself has just stopped working or whatever. And I thought, it's okay, it was auto-saving. And it didn't. I go back in and I'm two and a half hours behind where, where I thought I was. And I'm just, it's devastating. Particularly if your business, which is mine, is to build worlds, uh, you can't afford to lose two and a half hours of build time. 
Um, any any Minecraft builder will tell you that's a lot of blocks <laughs> placed. And so regularly, say, don't count on auto saving is what I would say. Outline selection, this is really handy. Outline selection, and I'll show you this when we're in the world, but this is t uh, where the world, uh, the block that you're looking at is outlined with a small black line. It's almost indiscernible, but it's actually really important once you get used to it. Quite often during CPD, teachers will say to me, I'm not sure what block I'm supposed to be looking at. And for me, that seems really obvious. I'm just like, but it's the one that you're looking right at. Now, I wouldn't say that, of course, but in my head, I'm thinking, but it's that one. And then I realised that this is a, 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 digi a 360 digital environment and it's not always commonplace for everyone to go, oh yeah, of course, it's that one of the thousands of blocks that are sitting in front of me. Um, there's a crosshair, et cetera. Um, and they, but the crosshair creates a slight outline. And when I point that out, which I now do by practice, I point it out, they go, oh yeah, I see that now. And then they know which one they're, they're, they're looking at. So it, it, it's, it's really slight, but it makes a difference once you know it's there. And I'll show you that when we're actually in game. In-game player names, brilliant for uh, any large groups. If you have children in a group of uh, anything, two, five, 10, up to 30, um, in, a, in a class at any one time, in a world at any one time, and that's the maximum 30. Um, you, you might want to see their player names because their player names are, are dictated by their Office 365 names. And generally that will give you an idea of who they are. I'm not entirely sure it's different for every uh, allocation, but it will give you an idea of who they are. Generally it's um, either their first initial and their second name or something like that. That's really handy when you've got a number of children in a world and they're all running around and you want to know who's who. That little kid that's chopping down that tree that actually should be paying attention um, or absolutely shouldn't be chopping down that tree, you know that that's little Craig. And little Craig, you need a word with him. And so in-game player names is actually quite handy. However, you can switch it off and it means they will not appear above the player's avatar. If you're doing something like, so for example, we do quite a lot of... Um, drama, theatre, stage stuff with digital stages and, and so on. We're doing a project just now with a, a kind of a made up um, stage and we don't want the play because it looks messy once they're all on stage at once. So we just take it off and they just play their characters and we know who they are and, and that's fine. So you might want to switch it off for certain viewings and maybe making videos, that kind of stuff. View bobbing. You'll notice I have this switched off. View bobbing is really important. Hey Richard, great to see you. Um... I switch it off because this is where you, basically your arms bob as you walk. It's kind of supposed to create a, a sense of realism about the way your body's walking because we don't walk perfectly straight and perfectly still with our heads and our arms don't move. Well, some people, I've seen some people <laughs> do that, but generally we have a slight bob about us. And so what we do is in game that happens. That's one of the contributing factors to lots of adults feeling sick. So I switch it off. So whenever I'm doing my training, I find that it reduces that. Certainly, even if it's not, eventually someone will get, you know, start feeling that, that motion sickness. It takes longer if view bobbing is switched off as well. So keep that in mind. I switch view bobbing off. Now, the next ones I'm just going to um, bunch together. Fancy leaves, fancy bubbles, render clouds, beautiful skies, smooth lighting and fancy graphics. These are all, except clouds, switched on for me because I'm, I'm broadcasting to you from a fantastic computer. But what if I wasn't? What if I was in a school with a lower end, less CPU and less graphic um, intense computer? What if I What if I couldn't? And that's the reality for lots of schools and some devices at home. And so you just switch these off. And they're not going to make a huge difference, but they are definitely going to make a difference. Oops. So I switch them on, you might want to switch them off. Keep that in mind. And I'll give you hints and tips about this as the month goes on and we can troubleshoot with some of you and so on. Render clouds is the only one I have switched off. And the reason for that is because, and I, I, we can switch this on later and I can show you in another uh, world, but render clouds just make, in fact, you might be able to see them just hovering in the background there in the, in the, the moving picture that's sitting behind the settings. You see these clouds up in the sky, these square white things in the sky above they can be they can be great they can be a pain depending on your altitude because they tend to be quite sort of low when it's mountainous terrain so if you're trying to do something that's quite sort of high or however you've built your world sometimes the clouds are just in, in it's like fog and you can't see anything i tend to switch them off um, it also helps with graphic intensity as well 
And then finally, field of vision can be altered uh, by gameplay. I switch that off, which means that field of vision thing we were talking about, it means that it just remains the same. You've set it to 60, it cannot be altered by gameplay, it's exactly the same. Um, and that's really important. And so, UI profile, just leave that as classic. There's pocket edition and classic, just leave it as classic, it's always the same, and it doesn't make a huge difference anyway. Render distance is really important. Render distance, you'll notice mine is up to 36 chunks. Now a chunk is 16 by 16 by 16 blocks. That's a chunk of land in Minecraft. I can see 36 of those in any direction I look, and I'll show you this later, but I can, it will render the world for 16 by 16 times 36, so I can see for miles. For less graphic able computers, you kind of want that sitting down even as low as eight. I've seen schools that have to use eight, some schools that use 12, some that use 16. Schools tend to be in this radius here. If you're able to get to 20 and 24, brilliant. Um, you know, good computers, gaming laptops will take you up to 36, 48 and, and further. Um, Particle render distance. Particles will also help. Particles are the little special effects that you get in Minecraft. Things like the droplets of rain, not the ones that fall, but the ones that splash up um, once the raindrops have hit the ground. Or potions. If you throw a potion and you throw it and it affects somebody, they get these little swirly particles around them. And it's beautiful. Um, it actually looks great. And um, the smoke that comes off campfires, etc. But actually, it can be graphic intensive. Um, so what you can do is you can just turn that down and it just means that um, this is blocks, I believe, not chunks. So this is 20, you know, if, if I am within 10 blocks, I will see the smoke on the campfire. If I step out with 10 blocks, I will no longer see the, the, the smoke for the campfire and it helps you to, to save some of that. Um, again, one of the big complaints we get from teachers is I tried it, I loved it but my computers couldn't handle it. And I say, well, let's try some stuff. Let's switch off fancy graphics, switch off beautiful skies, turn the render distance down um, and so on. And it makes a huge difference. I have to say though, um, on Microsoft's behalf, Minecraft Education Edition is actually very, very, very well optimized um, for poorer computers. So they've done a great job on that already. Uh, Anti-aliasing, somebody explained to me what that was once and I can't remember, I leave it at eight. Some of you might have it less. I'm quite sure it's not that important. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, apologies if I got it wrong. And then Texel anti-aliasing, I also don't know what that is. Again, if anything has gone wrong and you think, I don't, I don't know why this isn't working, don't worry. Click reset to default and take it from the top, start again <laughs> and go from there. That then leads me to audio. And you'll notice that my audio settings, if any of you are sitting with your own copy right now thinking, hang on a minute, I've got music up to 100 and I've got sound up to 100. Generally, that's how they'll start. So you might, you may or may not hear the music coming in on that and sound volume as well, which will allow you to hear sheep, cows and chickens and monsters and water, um, rainfall, etc. Uh, the music in Minecraft's lovely. Um, I'm almost tempted to put it on, but I'm not gonna, it's, it's super chill, it's a lovely soundtrack. You hardly even notice it's, it's ambient. You hardly even notice it's there. But if you're working with multiplayer groups and you don't have headphones and 30 of them play it at once, but they all logged on slightly differently at a slightly different time, uh, you end up with this really weird rave night. And so just turn it down. And then sound volume, I tend to turn down to 20 as well because the last thing you want are 30 cows or sheep or pigs or villagers or whatever, making noises around your classroom. So I tend to try and keep the sound as local as possible by turning it down or recommending that my children get headphones. And we, we, tr we try to care for that. Global resources, I'm not gonna talk about just now. We're gonna talk about that as an, a whole um, stream and I'm actually gonna bring in some experts on that. We've got some incredible builders around the world, some of which are, are watching. Um, and then storage. Yep, you'll see there that I have 98 worlds, totaling 2.1 gigabyte. I know for school systems, this is really important. Um, you may want to just keep an eye on that and you can get rid of worlds. We're gonna talk about world management next. And then uh, two, the last two things, penultimately language. This is really nice. At the moment we've got it as English UK, um, but you may want English US, which of course affects the keyboard and the spellings and so on. Um, but you can easily, just just as easily switch it to Spanish or Danish or Norwegian. Uh, 
for example, um, or Italian, whatever. Uh, we have we have used this to teach modern foreign languages. So uh, this was many many years ago, but I think we started doing this around eight years ago, where we would uh, we would bring in Minecraft. The kids would be super excited about it, and I would say to them, "And we're going to do this, and we're going to do this, and it's going to be super exciting." But we're going to do it all in French. Ah, oh, but we don't speak French. And I say, "Well, you better learn. You better learn what stone and gold and." Um, maps and north east south west and can I have 10 blocks of redstone please uh, you better you, you better learn and they do they are desperate to, to learn to play Minecraft in French because they know that that's how uh, that's how they're going to be allowed to access the, their mathematics curriculum in Minecraft or their literature curriculum in Minecraft so consider that um, just, even just as a little shake up to their day and say well let's go find out what stone is in in french and then the kids are like oh it's pierre and you say that's right and, and pierre rouge is red stone and so on and off they go and suddenly they start they just they pick it up you know i've actually learned loads of little um little things in minecraft about different languages italian and french and so on uh but ultimately you just go back to english uk and actually sorry i'll just show you there if we go to french you'll see it's changed on this side touche and profil um and so on and so we can it, it, it doesn't change what you type, of course, inside the game, but it does change all of the uh, the settings and the um, the buttons that the children will have to press and so on. Uh, all the menus, that kind of stuff. So it's really nice. And then have them speak in French while they're playing it. But we're going to go back to English uh, UK. And then finally, you can't really see this one. I know on the stream because of my um, my camera, but we have another one called How to Play. And How to Play brings up the following. This is everything from what's new, controls, HUD. I talked to you about the HUD, the inventory. How do you craft? What is world builder? Permission blocks, chalkboards, chemistry. Everything I'm going to teach you over the next month is neatly held inside Minecraft as a kind of a, a black screen, white writing reminder, a refresher. So I would strongly recommend it after we've done this over the next sort of remote learning month, just tap into this and say, all right, okay. So I go into, let's go back and show you how we got into that. We went into settings. And then at the very bottom on the left hand side, it's how to, and you can always revisit that. So um, I'm going to move on now to the game settings. Again, I apologize for anybody who's tuned in later. Um, this is the these, this is the foundation. The reason we did it twice today was just to get it out of the way. This is the foundation uh, stream to say, here's all the settings. These will be recorded and left on YouTube. You can visit these anytime, but going forward, we will be getting into the game and playing them. Um, but we have to do this first because it is vital. So I'm going to click on the play menu. Now I'm back to the main menu. I did that by pressing escape. If I press play and escape. If I press settings and escape, escape will always bring you back. Um, and then if you press escape again, it says, are you sure you want to exit? In this case, I want to cancel because I don't. But that's how you would escape the game. I'm going to click on play. And this brings us to a new set of menus. Let's check this one out first. First things first, the big one on the left, probably the first one you're inclined to want to go to, is View My Worlds. When you click on View My Worlds, you'll see in here that we have dozens and, what did we say? We had 98 worlds. So we've got Pirate Cove, we've got Immersive Mathematics, we have the Art World, the Social Studies on the back of the Black Bear, we have Vikings Worlds, Pompeii, you name it, we've got it, because we've been doing this for 10 years. But... We uh, we don't want to be here yet. This is just where your worlds are stored. For those of you who are doing this for the first time, you probably don't have any worlds in there, or you may have one or two test worlds, that's it. On the right hand side is view library, and this is a great place for everybody to start. This library is courtesy of uh, the Minecraft Education Edition team. And if you click on that, you have lessons, monthly build challenges, biomes and worlds and how to play tutorials and then you can also go into educator resources which takes you to a separate website and you can search for and download uh, certain materials um, under immersive minds and under digital labs we have some stuff in there and also in lessons and so on but let me explain what these are lessons is where you can literally find lessons on computer science maths science art and design history and culture language arts etc. Um, if we click on computer science, you'll see that there's an hour of code one that you can try or a coding course that you can try. If we go into maths, you'll see that there's common core grade three, grade four, um, there's uh, grade five, there's fractions, there's additional lessons. If we click on that, it'll take us to additional maths lessons. 
Oh, we're unable to connect you to the library. This can happen if your computer is offline. Definitely not offline. Um, so apologies for that. And then if we go back to science, we can go on chemistry, biology. We are the Rangers. That's one that we've uh, we've published. Uh, Extinction biodiversity crisis. Remarkable. Check out the orangutans in there. And then also additional lessons uh, there also. And so that's a nice place to start with your lessons, if you want. Uh, to, to, to go in there and say, actually, I'm just going to pick a maths lesson and try that. And here is monthly bill challenges. Oh, I st still thinks I'm not online. Na, 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 na. Or if access to the library catalogue is blocked. Well, would you look at that? Um, any feedback on that, let me know, because I've, I've never had that issue before. Um, but your monthly bill challenges are introduced every month by the Minecraft Education Edition team and they are, um, they're brilliant. They're just little challenges that you get your kids to do. And actually, I think in this time of remote learning and, and, and kids being stuck at home, that would be a great thing to tap into and say, well, what are the challenges? And there's a library of them, but every month there's a new one added. So check that out. Um, however, the one I like the most, apart from how to play, which I think goes without saying, if we click on, there's starting tutorials and some additional tutorials in there as well. If we go into biomes, biomes is where I point teachers at the most. Because quite often a teacher will say to me, I had one recently actually that said, I want to do this. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, Adam, if it's the firewall. I, I, I've never I've never had a problem from home. I'm, I'm streaming from home and I've never had a problem with that before. But I'll check it out. It's maybe because I'm streaming and it, maybe there's too much going on. I don't know. Um, but I've never I've never come across that before. So that's that's new for me tonight. Let's troubleshoot that, you and I. Um, but with the biomes, this is where I, pull, uh, I point my, my, uh, my customers at mostly, because quite often, just recently, I had someone come to me and say, I'm doing plastics in the ocean. And I started this world and I can't find an ocean. I've, I've gone for miles and I've gone over trees and hills and I found a big giant lake, but it wasn't the same. Um, and so on. Or I'm looking for a really good coral reef because uh, we're doing the, 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 uh, the death of the coral reefs in, in, in Australia, for example. And so what I say to them is get on the library, go into your game, get on the library and go into biomes and worlds. And if we click on biomes, there we are, I'm allowed in there, which is interesting. Um, you can see there that there's badlands, there's deserts, down here is the ocean biome and we can have an ocean biome if we wish. Uh, we can go to the jungle, say you're doing deforestation in the Amazon, just download the jungle biome and it will take care of the environment for you and in the streams that I'm going to continue to do over the month we're going to be looking at one of the streams will be focused on the three magic ingredients of making truly relevant meaningful engaging lessons for your students the jungle biome um, is just a part of that it's the environment uh, the ocean biome is the environment the forest biome is the environment and so on you might want the savanna because you're doing uh, conservation for example and you want to do that swamplands and so on there's your warm ocean biome um, in there. So let's take that. Let's see what that looks like. So I say to myself, right, I know I'm going to do this coral reef. So I'm going to click on that and it will tell us up here. It's this is what it's called. This is what size it is, a little description of it. And then what we can do is we can click create world. And that will now take me back out and it will take me directly into that world. It all you can play with the settings later. But here we are. Simple as that. Into the library, into the biome, warm motion. And if we now jump inside the water, we can see that we have fish and we have coral reefs and we can start our children off immediately. If we've got the lesson plan, we know what it is we're trying to achieve. We can set our children off immediately. There's no building worlds and trying to make sure we've got the right environment and we've some somebody somewhere has made a coral reef for us. It's been done um, and so on. We can then go into settings in game and we can change some of those things that I'm going to show you later. So we can go, I'm going to show you next. So I was like, actually, I needed coordinates and I wanted it to be always day. I don't want it to be nighttime, for example. And you can do that at once you're in the game. When you're finished, click save and exit. And what will happen is. Great to have you on, Adam. Thanks for joining me. If you go to view my worlds, you'll notice that warm ocean biome was the last world I was in. So that's now stored. You don't have to go back to the biome list. You don't have to go back to the library. Warm ocean biome is now yours. It's your version. It's stored locally on your computer. And that's actually worth saying. These, can, In fact, just tonight, Emma Nass in, in Sweden said to me, we're going to be doing some uh, remote learning, but my children... How do they get their worlds from their computer? Because they're, they're locally stored in school. And so your worlds are locally stored. I will be doing a whole stream on managing worlds later, but super quick, if you click on, once you click on this, rather than play, 
you would click on settings and go right down to the bottom and you have what's called export world. You export it as a single file. This is a .mc world file. Stick it on OneDrive, stick it on a, a memory stick, email it to someone. We've emailed them loads. Um, use a VLE to, to kind of put it out there. Um, if you're a Scottish teacher and you're using Glow, stick the worlds on Glow in a small library so that other people can tap in and then people can download them from there. Kids can get access to them at home. What they would do at home is they would add to it if they were doing homework, for example, or remote learning, they would add what they wanted to it, then they would re-upload it. And when they get to school, they would download it again. And you just have that cloud um, in, the, in the middle or that memory stick in the middle. Um, so otherwise, they're, they're hosted locally. So you need to know how to export. But we'll do all of that properly as a whole stream um, eventually. What else is on this page? Create new. That's where we're going next. Um, join world, which is if you are going to join a multiplayer world, we're going to have a whole stream later this week dedicated just to multiplayer. And then we're also going to have import worlds. And that is where, just to tap onto the, um, the, the back of the, uh, the export that we just did there, you would click on import and you'll see these are all my worlds. So there we've got RC Village. Uh, uh, this is the um, drama world, art world, chemistry, and they're all just MC worlds. They're just they're just one single file, and I would double click on one of those, or click on it and click open, and it would automatically come into my library, um, uh, come into my world. Sorry, over here. So what we're going to do next for the remainder of this stream, and this stream is all about settings. So forgive me if uh, if this is stuff you already know, but it's the foundations. It's really important. We're going to go into uh, either create new. Or if you go into view my worlds, you'll see there's a new world setting up there. But we're just going to get into the habit of doing create new. And you'll see that there's templates you can download. We'll talk about those another time. In fact, we saw most of them um, in the biomes and so on. But if we click on new, we're taken to the create new world settings for a new world. And this will, by the time we're finished this, this will lead us nicely to tomorrow's stream at 12 o'clock noon GMT, which is getting into our world and playing W, E, S and D, forward and back, uh, 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 um, jumping, flying, um, you name it, uh, orientating, using the coordinates, everything that we're going to do tomorrow. So on the left hand side here, similar to the other settings page, you've got play or host. We're only going to use play, but not yet. We've got, uh, and we're also in the game settings at the moment. So you see that there. And we also have resource and behavior packs, which we'll talk about later in the month. We're going to do two streams. I'm just reminding everybody who's on. We're going to do two streams every day for a month and every stream is going to be different. Unlike today, this was the foundations. As of tomorrow, every stream, morning and afternoon, different, different, different. And then they're stored on YouTube for you to come and visit again. So we're going to call this uh, world um, testing. I cannot express enough how important it is to name your worlds. The number of times we get contacted with a, an email or, a, or, or, a, or even just a, a direct message on Twitter saying, Stephen, I can't find my chemistry world. I've got seven, 17 worlds and I can't find my chemistry world. Help. And I can't help you because if you didn't name it chemistry or my chemistry world or whatever, I can't help you. Um, and that's really more important when you're dealing with 30 children and they're using and they've got seven different worlds. So get into the habit of finding a naming system that you enjoy, a naming system that works for you and your students. And then um, so quite often when we're working with our development teams, we do 0, uh, 0 0.0.1. And that's and if we make say I give that world to someone and they make an adjustment, they do 0 0.0.2, 0 0.0.3. Every change, I say to them, rename the world, export it, send it back to me. And that, and that generally works. Um, once we're ready and it's finished, it gets a full name and it just gets 1.0. And that's it. It's done. I know that that was the finished version that the, the student sent to me. I say, when you're finished and you know that all of your work has been done, name it 1.0, send it to me. That's the one that I work with or that's the one that I mark, for example. Um, otherwise, at least give it a name that's identifi identifiable from all the others. Default game mode. When your children enter this world, or when any of you enter your world, what is the default game mode? Survival mode or creative? Survival is exactly what it says. You have to survive. Uh, monsters will kill you. Gravity will kill you. F um, well, it's not gravity that kills you, is it? It's the thump um, as you hit the ground. But, the, you know, falling will kill you. Um, 
lightning will kill you, you will drown, etc, etc. So you have to survive against the environment and other players or monsters. Creative is the one we generally choose. I never, ever, ever make worlds lessons in survival mode. That's not to say that my students don't experience survival lessons like our Scottish uh, Border Reavers world where they fight against, the, they become part of the Border Reavers um, and we teach the history of Scotland or our Viking clan world where they they, they, they raid as Viking clans and, and, and they see um, how much they can raid and what that was like to, to, you know, clothing, culture, currency, language, food, religion, you name it, it's all in there. Um, that They do that as, but I don't build it as uh, survival. And then finally, uh, so that's, sorry, so that's, um, that's creative mode. And then moving on, sorry, to difficulty. In difficulty, we have four settings, but I want you to imagine that it's only two. I want you to imagine that it's peaceful and then there's a little line there and then it's easy, normal or hard. And what this means is, Will, if you have monsters, well, will you have monsters? And if you do, will they be easy, normal or hard? Peaceful means no monsters. And that's what I generally build on. I don't need zombies and I don't need skeletons and I don't, I don't need any of that when I'm building a lesson. I'm building, you know, the fall of Constantinople and I want to build the broken wall where the, the, um, uh, the breach was made with some signposts. And I don't, I don't need zombies while I'm there. Or... I do need zombies because they're actually going to be the enemy. They're going to be the, the Turks on the inside of the wall, for example, and I need them to be on easy or normal or hard. Who knows? Uh, whichever I decide that I challenge I want for my kids. But in the meantime, we're going to stick for this for this demo. We're going to stick to peaceful. This next one is really important. This is the perm and this is new and it's fantastic. Uh, it's a great addition to the Minecraft Education Edition um, system. And that is how do the students that join my world interact with that world and it used to be that they just joined and that was it whereas now they can either join as a visitor where they can freely explore sorry explore the world but cannot interact with blocks items entities uh, trust players is basically um is basically off members members are active players in the world who can break and create blocks and attack mobs and other players or operators are members who can set player permissions and use commands to have more control over your world. So what that means is, can they do nothing except push some buttons and pull some levers and experience a narrative-driven world that I've maybe read some signs, meet some NPCs, but that's it. Can they interact with the world, break things, uh, attack mobs, be part of the world, but not change anything fundamentally, certainly not about the settings, or are they operators who work like me and can change uh, and can change certain things about the world? Do they have access to the command codes that let them change day to night or make it rain or make, make it stop raining? How, what level do I want them in at? This is really important. Again, we have teachers that say to us, I let my kids into my world the other day and this happened and I, and, and I don't know why. And I say to them, can we just check that world? And it turns out their kids were operators and kids know what to do when they're operators. Have, make no bones about it. Kids know. And so... I recommend, uh, I generally allow them to be members in my world. I want them to interact, I want them to build and so on. Um, but I don't necessarily want them to have full control. This is actually really nice. If you do have kids that are particularly good at this and they work with you and they are, um, maybe, maybe you want them to help you and you want them to give them the sort of prestigious position of moderating as operators, bring them in to the fold and say, I want you to be one of my operators and here's what I need. Here's the responsibility. These are the powers that you have. Here's how I want you to use them. And you can build a little community around that. It's kind of like on live streams and having moderators um, and so on. Speaking of which, I need to log back in. I don't know why, but I've been logged out in my chat. So if any of you are talking to me, I don't know that you are. Um, if you have any questions, please ask as well. I will try my best to answer them. Um, go. It says that my stream is offline. Is my stream offline? I think I'm still streaming. I'm going to check OBS. Am I still streaming? Yeah, yeah I'm still streaming. Okay, just uh, restream says I'm not, but that's okay. Back to game. Right, so let's stick that on members uh, and, and, and leave it at that. Now, world type, flat, infinite or old? 
This is really important. A flat world is exactly what it says it is. It's an entirely flat world. Oh, I know what it is. I've lost the internet on my uh, my other PC, so that's fine. Don't worry about that. It just means I can't see your chat for the moment. Um, flat world is exactly that. It's a flat world uh, made up of four layers. It has one layer of bedrock, two layers of dirt, one layer of gla uh, grass, and that is it. It goes for miles. And I'll, what I'll actually do is I'll call this testing flat, and we'll explore that in a second. This is actually... Why would you use this? This is what I call my canvas world. It's a huge flat canvas, like a big piece of paper. And I say to the kids, um, we're going to do, see DNA. We're going to do DNA and, and we're going to build, we're going to explore and research what DNA looks like. We're going to look at the double helix and then I want you to build a 3D model of it in Minecraft and then label it and show me why all the parts are distinct and why all the parts are important and so on. And the kids are like, yeah, we're going to do that. And then I say to them, and we're going to do it on a flat world because what I don't need are children distracted by trees and mountains and holes in the ground and they, oh, there's a cave and off they go. I don't need that. I just need them to be in one uh, one space with no distractions. Um, and so before I go any further, let me show you what that looks like. Play and you'll see exactly what I mean. There we are. Big flat world with some animals, which I can switch off, of course. But if I dig down one, two, three, four, and then I fall through, I literally fall underneath the earth. It's a hole in the ground. Um, and of course, you don't want to do that. So we can just put that back. And then that grass will eventually grow back. Um, and so, uh, as you can see, they can wander for miles and there is nothing for them to do. And I love that. That's actually a really, really, really helpful um, function. Save and exit. Let's go back into... Uh, let's get into the habit of clicking Create New new and let's call this one testing infinite creative peaceful member this time we're going to go infinite and i'm going to click play now check out what this looks like and how very very different this is to the rest of uh, the, fl the the flat world view that i showed you oh look there's a, a, a desert village already and all of a sudden we've got mountains and trees and rivers and this is, an, and it goes on, the reason it's called infinite is because it goes on infinitely. Um, and there's so many, oh, I, I haven't said that, I think I'm on a giant peninsula or island, but the ocean would equally go on forever and ever and ever. Um, and it's, it's fantastic, but it can be a, a great distraction. Great question is, well, why would I use this? Um, kind of like the biome worlds I was telling you earlier, sometimes you just want kids to ha go in and maybe have a survival adventure, or sometimes you want kids to go in and look at a particular, say, oh my goodness, look, there's an island over there, let's go look at that. Or maybe we're going to make a volcano, let's make Pompeii, and we'll make this the volcano, and we'll put Pompeii here. And sometimes you just need a world, excuse me, to get started. You just need to or a river. Let's do river pollution. And all we really need is a world that has a river in it. That's not difficult. Here's one here. So let's zoom down on this river and we'll use this as our model for looking at river pollution. And then you might have a whole bunch of lessons um, based around that. So let's do that. There we go. So we're down at the river and we can now do that ourselves. And so that's an infinite world. I'm going to save and exit that. And then there's a third version, which is really, really handy. Create new, new, and we're going to call this testing old. Remember creative mode, peaceful, member, old this time. Now, the old world looks like this. Now, there is one caveat to using the old world. I personally love the old world. I genuinely do. But it's really, really important that we talk about the one issue that there is with old worlds. And so if we look around, you'll see that it's still in an infinite model. You still get the trees and the rivers and the, but it's, it's just a cube. The whole thing is just a cube. And it's fantastic for locking your children into a space for a given lesson. Especially if you only have 45 minutes or 25 minutes to do the whole lesson. And you're like, right kids, here's what I want you to do. You're going to jump in this world. We're going to use old world format. And every, everyone will be different. I'll explain that in a second as well. But every child might be different or you might bring them into your old world as, um, as the host. And then what we can do is we can um, 
we can have them here. And no matter where you are, even if I go into settings and video, and I go down to render distance 12 chunks, which is what some computers in schools are capable of, you can still see the edges. There's the edge, there's the corner, edge, corner, edge, corner. So even at 12 chunks, you can still see what um, all of your children are doing and where they are if you just sort of like sand above them and have a look around. Um, let me just switch that back up though. Uh, that was video. Turn that up and turn that up. There we are. Here's the thing though. What I'm going to do is I'm going to build a yellow pillar. And the reason I'm going to do that is because this is the only issue with old worlds. And it took us a while to discern what it was that was going wrong with them. But if I say I build my lesson here, I'm just going to build this yellow pillar. There we are. So that's where my lesson is. That lesson is a castle or that lesson is a volcano or we've gone in and we've built this awesome thing. But I actually want my children to start over here and take a journey to it. Maybe it's part of a narrative or something. Now, you can do a thing in a game called set world spawn. If I just do forward slash set world spawn, that means that I will set the spawn world to where the, the, the starting point of that world to where I am standing, which means anybody who goes into that world new starts now, okay, in that position. If I save and exit, and then I give that world to someone, when I go into view my worlds and I go back into testing old, we will find, I hope this works now. <laughs> yeah, I can see it's worked already. The world has been sliced. Remember, I asked for them to start there, but you'll see here that this tree is floating somewhere and now it's much it's much thinner. In fact, it's longer than it is, it's longer than it is wider. And that's because we set the world spawn. And what that means is the world spawn has a radius and it basically looks at it like a giant square and it says, I will spawn you in the middle of the square. And so when you move that square away from its original um, position and you set world spawn, it discounts anything outside of it and it literally chops the world away. So we have lost lots and lots and lots of stuff by setting the world spawn for an adventure world and losing it and having to rebuild the worlds. Um, so I, I wanna put that out there. That's the whole purpose of this um, is that you don't make the same mistakes that we've made. Um, it's, it's purely because we changed the set world spawn. So my advice to you is, do use uh, these worlds, do use old worlds, just don't change the spawn area, build to the spawn area. Know where you're gonna start, it's where you started when you first entered, and build to that. Save and exit. Again, we've had lots of teachers saying, I had this amazing thing and it's gone. Um, and we try to fix it, and there's little fixes that I can work on personally, um, but generally it's very difficult to, to, to kind of get back. So let's go back to, I'm just gonna do uh, new world. Then I'm going to do test final. That's what we'll call it. And then we're going to do creative, peaceful, member. Uh, I'm going to do infinite. Seed. A seed is, here's the thing. When you start a world, an infinite world, every single world you ever start will be entirely unique from the others. No two children in your class will ever start the same world. If they do, call me. It's amazing. Like statistically amazing um but and i've always wondered if it ever did actually happen uh but a seed every world is given a seed so every world is given a seed number based on its generation its initial generation and so that number can be found and i'll show you this later uh, in the week when we're inside the world and we're going to do seeds properly later and we're going to look at really good seeds that we can um, give you like shipwreck seeds and stuff like that that have amazing shipwrecks already in them um but that seed might look something like that. And just a jumble of numbers. But if a child in your class, say you're doing a lesson and you're like, I wish we had a waterfall. And some kid in your class says, I've got a waterfall. There's a, there's a great cliff over here and there's a waterfall pouring into a river. And you're like, great, give me the seed to your world. So then they go in and they read the seed out and you put it up on the board. And then every other child puts that in here and then says play, they will get exactly the same world that the other student has. So 
for a while, people used to think oh, it's, it's impossible for me to, other than duplicating the world and handing it out on a memory stick or on, a, on the cloud. But that's not true. Um, you can seed everyone into the same world. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do that. I'm just gonna random number. Let's see what this turns out like. Um, and then simulation distance chunks answers on a postcard. I've never used it. Um, I think it's when you're doing code simulations. I am not sure. Adam, if you're still in the chat, let me know. Um, actually, speaking of the chat, I still can't get in. So let me try that one more time. No, that is just not working. That is just not going to let me in at all. Let me try it one more time. Restream chat. I might just have to start the chat function up again. Apologies, everyone. Trials and tribulations of using tech. Now, we're a little over, but actually... Hold on, we're connected. Oh, I'm in. Yay, now we're in the rear classroom environment. PC. It's Kane.net is talking to me. I've lost everybody's chat before that, though, so apologies. Um, actually, I haven't if I just window Minecraft. There we go. Oh, I see you. Sarah Clark's in with us. Uh... King.net, great to see you in. Lots of chat. I will catch up on all of that later. I don't want to mess up the stream for, for catching up just because my, my computer crashed. Um, although I can see it again now. Okay, this then takes us to our specific world options. And this is where we're going to kind of get go through these and then we'll finish off. So, world options. Show coordinates. Coordinates are really important, not just for when you're coding, although we are going to do a coding stream later on in, in I think I will reach coding in about uh, six or seven days um, based on my current plan for the live stream. Two a day, every day. Show coordinates is really important. Basically, Minecraft works because it's block based and it's therefore grid based. It works on the basis of coordinates. And so you can switch them on at any time and you will end up with your X, your Y and your Z. Up, down, left, right, forward and back. North, east, south, west, um, and uh, up and down. And that is particularly handy for teaching the children about exactly that sort of stuff. So um, in, in my case, I, I'm always t talking to the kids about using the coordinates instead of teleport. Because quite often the kids will say, I'm over here, I found this cave. And it's, oh, teleport me. And I'm like, no, 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 use the coordinates to find your way there. So give them the X, Y, and Z and let them find it. And then they, oh, and they orientate themselves in the world and they know that they have to head you know, 200 this way, then they have to turn north and go 200 that way and they work it all out and it's, uh, it's fantastic. But it's particularly good for coding, which we'll talk about again another time. Immediate respawn. I actually just have this switched off. This just means that the children will not or the players, I keep talking about children because I'm so used to using it with students, um, but the players in your world will not be given a choice to respawn or quit to the main menu. They'll just automatically respawn. I tend to leave it off because um, it's kind of second nature for them to just go, oh, respawn, and they start again. Um, so that's 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 fine. Activate cheats. Adam, if you're still listening, can we, can we change that? Um, let's have activate commands or something. Um, it's just not a great kind of message, I think. But um, that's on my wish list for you, Adam, which I will get to you. But um, activate cheats means can the players use the commands forward slash weather clear, forward slash time set day? Can they use the commands to change the way that teleport forward slash TP at player at P to this location? Can they do those things using activate cheats? And if you don't want them to, switch that off. Um, in the stream this morning, David Renton and I, uh, an educator who's now in the States, um, Scottish educator now in the States, was talking um, about exactly that, why and when you would have that switched off. Um, yeah, uh, Kane.net, that's something that I was talking about this morning as well, is on that basis, if we go up to, and, and Adam, if you're still on and listening, um, help, help us out with this. Only an operator, we assumed, only an operator now, and we need to test this, and this is what this stream is all about, so we're going to test all of this, can set player permissions and use commands. So assuming that you have them in there, but you don't want them using, um, you don't want them using that. Or, 
Otherwise, does this become a defunct button? Was one of the teacher questions this morning, if you're using these up here appropriately. Surely only operators can use it. So great question. And we're going to try that actually. When we do multiplayer, which is later this week, we're going to try it. Code Builder, do you want the children to access Code Builder? Of course, we would all love to do computer studies and computer science while we're, um, while we're playing uh, Minecraft. But actually, I, I actually switch that off if I know that this lesson is not intended for that. And the reason for that is because quite often I will mistakenly press the C key. And I'll explain that when we come to do coding later on in the week. But you press the C key in game, which automatically opens up Code Builder. And when you're pre pressing W, E, S, and D, particularly the D key and the space bar, you have this tiny gap between your finger and your thumb where the C key lives. And the number of times I click it and it stops my game, it opens up Code Builder, it's right there. And kids get their hands up in their classes all the time, oh, I've pressed something and I don't know what it's done. And I say, oh, it's okay, you've just made Code Builder come up. Ideally, I, I know it's handy to have it there, but I would also, um, uh, like for it to buy, be by default somewhere else, um, but it's 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 there. I switch it off, and I say, I tell my kids we're not doing Code Builder today, and um, so we're just going to switch Code Builder off, right? And then this one here is always day. Do I want it to go nighttime? If I'm creating worlds as a teacher and I'm setting my world up right now to create a world, do I want to do always day? Uh, yes, because I don't want it to be nighttime. It gets dark at night, and it's more difficult to play. And so I don't want that. You can, uh, Kane.net, you can re-enable any of these later in game. You could just press escape, go to settings. And while you're in the game, all of these are available for you to toggle on and off. Does include the students as well, however. Um, if you're the host of the world, only you can do it. But in a single player world, the kids can do it as well. Tick speed. Minecraft works on a basis of time, which is measured in ticks. So someone coders, I have a, a, a phenomenal... Um, a creative coder that works with me uh, called Dragnoz, who will quite often talk about ticks. He'll say, look, this is going to happen in 500 ticks. Not in real life. Although I imagine he does, actually. <laughs> um, now that I think about it, he probably does. But, um, but certainly in-game, he talks about this will happen in 500 ticks. This will happen in 400 ticks. This is going to be a, a 10 tick repeating command block. And I've learned through him to talk in Minecraft time in ticks. Where would this be handy? Let me actually show you. Um, actually, I'll show you another time. We'll do ticks another time specifically because it's actually quite remarkable to watch an entire world speeded up. No, 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 you know what? We've got time. I've gone over, but I don't care because, you know, if you're listening and you're in and you're tuned in, and we do, we still have a, num a good number of people in. And so um, I am going to go into play. Just, we're, the settings will all be the same. And I'm going to show you what it's like to have tick speed turned up and why. Let me go and get a sapling. When we plant trees, saplings can take 10 to 15 minutes to grow. So if I place a sapling and a sapling and a sapling there. And we can sit now for 10 to 15 minutes and they will grow randomly because they're set to a range of ticks. After 3,000 ticks, between 3,000 and 5,000 ticks, for example, this will happen. If I go into settings and I go down to the bottom and I change that to 2,000, all of my trees have grown super quick. And now that I'm in 2,000, I can just plant another one and it will grow. And plant another one and it will grow. This is handy if you want to be doing lessons on forestry. Say you're doing deforestation and you want to make a very particular forest in a very particular area that has, and I'm giving you lesson ideas now, for sustainable forestry. And you want your children to have a set number of trees that you know they can cut down that will give them X amount of um, resources. But you want to see how they manage that sustainably. You want to see if they chop those trees down and then take the saplings that they get from those trees and replant them and do sustainable uh, forest cropping. Um, which is one of our lessons, actually. It's one of our science lessons, um, earth science lessons. Um, and invariably, children don't. They don't replant. And then they come to you later and they say, I need more trees. And you say, well, didn't you plant the saplings? No. And I'll say, OK, let's go back and look at this again. But you'll see that I'm planting them and they're growing super quick. Now that I've planted that little forest, I can go back to settings. I can go down and I can either click reset random tick speed or so on. If I make that zero, time doesn't move. Uh, so let's make it zero, 
and then press escape. Time will not move now. Trees will never grow. Um, baby animals will never grow up. Uh, and so on. And so that is, um, yeah, that's, well, that's, that's ra random tick speed, which I find it handy. But I imagine as a beginner, you might at this point be thinking, oh, I'll come back to that. I, I don't know what I'd use that for um, at the moment. So let's let's come back to that. And then save and exit. And then I'll finish the settings. My world's uh, test final settings, right? This is us back where we were. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go down to this last one, which is show classroom settings. And this opens up another little collection, which is our final collection before we finish. So, perfect weather. Do we want it to rain? And when you live in Scotland, any toggle that offers you perfect weather, you click. That's all I'm saying. Um, yes, I don't want it to rain. Rain is noisy and it's a pain in the it's a pain in the bottom. But when you're playing and it's distracting and it's noisy and you you don't want it. However, here's the thing. You might need weather. What if you were doing something on uh rainfall um, for environmental science what if you were doing something on uh, we're, one of the lessons that i'll show you later is helping people with um hydroelectric power to explore water pressure and you need rainfall to be able to do that now rain just because rain falls doesn't mean that the water floods although we can code flooding which i'll also show you this month but what if we just wanted to use a mechanic that allowed rain to de to be detected so that we know we're getting rainfall so our reservoirs are filling up and so these are really important questions and that's why this is perfect for us it's like perfect weather no or yes you can also if you've got perfect weather you can make it rain manually um, when you want to which is also great allow mobs this is really important if you're taking notes genuinely take notes um, on this it says my stream is offline did I lose my stream no I think I lost internet on the other computer. I'm going to have to just keep an eye on that. Maybe it's that PC. It's a Surface Go. And it's not working. Um, so, uh, allow mobs is really important. Mobs are the creatures in Minecraft. Sheep, cows, this includes everything. Sheep, cows, uh, and chickens, and parrots, and so on, as well as uh, creepers and zombies and so on and quite often teachers will say to me i said i didn't want mobs i i i tipped no mobs because i don't want mobs um but now i can't get sheep i just didn't want monsters and so remember allow mobs allows all mobs there is no toggle animals and there is no toggle monsters although i would like that i'd love that i know teachers would love that um but we've already said that we want a peaceful world not easy, normal or hard monsters, we want peaceful. So this is your monster controller up here, which means if you allow mobs, you just won't get monsters, you'll get animals, which is great. You want animals on farms, for example, you want, you know, you want that kind of stuff. So, so mobs, it includes all mobs, but it's controlled alongside peaceful or easy, normal or hard. So keep that in mind. Allow destructive items, I'm gonna say no, and the reason I don't want destructive items is because in my classroom, I don't need the kids making TNT, which blows the world up. I also, a big, big chunks out of it at least. I also don't want children making, uh, setting fire to forests with flint and steel, and I don't want them uh, pouring lava everywhere. And so destructive items include those three things, TNT, flint and steel, and lava, and, you will, and, and students will not be allowed to destroy the world using those three things. You can switch that off. And uh, and then I think player damage and player versus player damage should be together. Let's ignore immutable world for a second. That's the one I will finish on. Um, but player damage and player versus player damage are, do my players get damaged? If they're in survival mode, will they, if they fall, will they hurt? Um, I think if you're in survival mode, you kind of need to allow that. That's the point. Otherwise, just, you know. But for younger kids that are playing the Gruffalo, for example, and they might fall in the water by accident, maybe I don't want them to get damaged. Um, we have a Gruffalo world where the children read in pairs and one of them reads while the other one plays and then the other one reads on the way back while the other one plays and they share the book experience through Minecraft. Um, so it's physically reading while playing and we've done that for a series of books as well. 
I'm going to say yes, they can be damaged if they're in survival mode. But I am going to say that I don't want player versus player damage. And here's the thing. It invariably will happen. It's like the playground. One child will have a go at another child or there'll be a scuffle or they'll think it's funny just to knock another child off a cliff or something um, in the game. And what they will and that'll happen and you'll get please sir he, he knocked me off the cliff or he hit me when i came out of the the house that i was in or whatever and it's and actually you just switch it off they get bored they they can't do anything their swords go through each other and they can't do anything and they're like oh player versus player switched off these are particularly handy for those worlds where i'll be honest you, if you set the rules of minecraft you actually get very little of that um i've found you get very little of that and you know what if you're getting that your lessons probably not doing what it should be doing let's be honest about that your lesson is probably not doing what it should be doing for all of the children in your class and so maybe we need a different tact maybe we need to change the groups maybe we need a different pedagogy maybe we need a different world or lesson um i, I very very rarely ever have that um but if you do switch player versus player damage off and then finally immutable world that just means, can the world be mutated? Can it be built upon? Can it be destroyed? Can your children do something with the world? Um, and the answer is, um, if it's switched on, no, they can't. If it's switched on uh, off, yes, they can. So let's try that. This is the last thing I'm gonna show you. So let's switch immutable world on and press play. So I'm gonna go in. And then the first thing you're gonna notice is that I can't do anything. I can't place, it's giving me this sort of like block block uh, blockage block i can't place any trees i can't destroy i'm going to go and chop this tree down i'm not allowed i'm not allowed it gives me that horrible sound that's because the world is immutable now later on in the week i'm going to show you i think uh not not monday but tuesday i'll be showing you build allow in fact no tomorrow build allow build deny blocks um will be will come into feature and i'll be showing you more of that but at the moment we can't actually build if we go into settings and we change the world, show classroom settings, immutable world off, we can plant again and we can destroy again. And so we can set worlds. So take the Gruffalo world that I mentioned earlier. The Gruffalo world is built in such a way that they can't destroy the forest because the forest is very cleverly linear. So they walk and they follow a linear path where they've been blocked um, to, to follow that path. What we then do is we give them areas using allow blocks where they can build. Otherwise, there's nothing they can do. Um, it's And there's also a code for it. So if I just do immutable world true, press enter, the children can't do anything. They can just follow the narrative, press some buttons, pull some levers, that kind of stuff. Um, and we'll do more about this later. Immutable world will keep coming up because a lot of the worlds, when I start going into the lessons like Pompeii, for example, or the Vikings lessons that we've done, um, our mathematics lessons, a lot of those worlds are immutable. And we'll explain why and where they can build and how they can build and why that's appropriate. So I'm just going to save and quit there. This, uh, the whole point of today's morning and afternoon um, streams were so that we could get through this part we could get through the create new worlds we could view the library we could check out the settings menus we could understand where we might need to be if our computers weren't playing it properly or were struggling with it what would happen if the controls had been damaged uh, or changed along the way language settings etc all of that was important today tomorrow we're going to start with playing the game what are the basics what do you need to know what does a world look like how do we start building? Let's build something together. So I would advise anybody who wants to take part, and I'll put this out on social media as well, bring your devices. And even if you don't have Minecraft Education Edition, you will have um, access, I assume, to Java or Bedrock or something. And, and play alongside me and we'll build things together. I'll give you instructions on what to build and how, and I'll give you visual cues and so on. Um, keep in mind though, if you're, if you're, children if you're a parent watching from home or you're a teacher at home because of the remote learning um, uh, coronavirus incident keep in mind that microsoft have very generously opened all office 365 education accounts up to minecraft 
So if you didn't have it previously, you definitely have it now. So you just need your student's Office 365 account, um, or certainly your Office 365 account and their passwords, and your students can join us as well at home. And later on in the month, we are going to have student lessons where we're going to be building with students. We're going to be building with some of our uh, favourite teachers who kind of work with us, um, artists, coders, a whole month, every day, twice a day, Minecraft Education Edition. Thank you very much for listening and everybody stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Bye.